Another episode of The Scoops with Sally and Kevin. It's, as always, great to see you guys. We're, we're a little bit later today on Friday, but that's all fine. People are, people are still listening. And we're actually working this week while the Saskatchewan legislature, uh, you know, quote, unquote, they are working. But, uh, but we are definitely podcasting, so it's, it's nice to see you guys. You too. Yeah, same same to you, Dale. Hope you hope you both had a great Easter. I'm I'm on day 16 of my COVID um, oh. session, and this morning on day 16 was the first morning I woke up without that COVID headache. People might have heard about it or read about it, yeah. but it's that. And I've talked to others who've had COVID, and it's still in my sinuses a bit and in my chest. But uh, you know, I'm thankful that I'm, I'm I'm nowhere near as bad as maybe a lot of other people. But that headache just kind of sits there with you, and it's like you pop Advil or Tylenol till the cows come home, and it doesn't seem to impact it. But anyway, I first morning in sixteen days, so I'm pretty optimistic about it. Pretty much Excellent. being done. So I'm uh, I'm still mercifully uh, am, am, am winning the the COVID roulette game. But on Monday, um, I just I, w- I was sitting down in my office, and all of a sudden felt like I'd been hit like a ton of bricks, and I was like, oh no, here we go. Uh, but I've been testing negative, and and I'm. Uh, I think it was just a, a, a bad day or maybe a migraine or something like that. So well, it's funny because that's – well, not funny, but that's how it started with me, Sally. I was working yep. on a Wednesday. I'd gotten back from Ontario uh, with my partner down watching her daughter play basketball, and a couple of days later, my back started to hurt doing one of these Zoom calls. And I was supposed to, supposed to play indoor golf that night, and my back just kept getting worse and worse, thinking like oh. I pulled a muscle. So I texted my buddy, and I said, I, I don't think I can play golf tonight. And he texted back, and he said, COVID? And I went, COVID? Mm. I never even thought of COVID. So I had a rapid test here. I tested myself. Sure enough, I was positive. And then that night oh. is when it just like exploded in my yeah. head and whatnot. So. It's fascinating how many different symptoms and, and ways yeah. it affects different people different ways. Yeah. It really, yeah. it really varried for me too, you guys. So yeah, I was just, I was just thinking that same thing. It, it really depends. And yeah. Well, anyway, anyway ho- ho- yeah. hope you start feeling better, Kevin. Yeah, no, I feel, uh, yeah, I feel no. a lot better. Thanks Dale and Sally. Appreciate it. Yeah. No headache is good. Yeah. So um, we're going to talk. We um, and we'll get into the, into this. So this week, as I as I mentioned at the at the top, uh, the legislature, the the spring legislative session, they're on break this week. Um, it's kind of the mid uh, the midpoint uh, break in session. So we thought it would be fun to do a spring session uh, halftime report. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. Um, the Leader Post had a story about the Saskatchewan Liberal Party uh, this week, and they're doing a petition. But really, I think we'll talk not so much about the petition as opposed to what what's going on with the Liberal Party um, and some other third parties. Uh, we're going to talk about our Hansard hot takes, of course, uh, and if we get time, we're going to talk about a column that um, that our friend Murray Mandrick. Uh, wrote this week, uh, which which was of interest to us. But before we get into that, I wanted to read the the somebody left a very nice uh, five star review of the podcast Ooh. on Apple Podcast. So and and this this was not me. I did not write it. <laughs> Wasn't me either. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure who this was. But so they write um, uh, the scoop. Um, uh, entertaining, insightful, and finally political podcast about Saskatchewan. Sally, Dale, and Kevin provide insightful analysis about politics uh, in Saskatchewan. This is my new favorite pod, and I can't wait for the new episode each week. Excellent. And that was from. That was from. I can't figure out what this name. These are anonymous names, typically. Thish, Dose, B. I don't know what it is, but anyway, regardless, very, very nice review. So, Thank if you anybody so much. else is, yeah. If anybody else is listening and you'd, and you'd like to leave a review on Apple Podcasts, uh, please do. That that really really helps people see the podcast. Or, so, or uh, ideas of what they might want to see us talk about if they have some. Totally. Uh, I'd be yes. more than happy to take suggestions on on things that the, the listeners might want to delve yeah, into. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about that too. So they're on, on our website, uh, thescoop.ca, there, there is a contact form. So if anybody want, wants to leave us a note about – yeah, as Kevin says, either topics or questions about, you know, things that are going on or um, if they want some insight and analysis on certain things, please please go on there and, yeah, and leave us a note. That, that would be very good. And uh, maybe if we get enough, we can do kind of like a mailbag thing at some totally. point soon. Yeah, that would be fun. 
All right. The second thing, really quick off the top, Scott Moe has been banned from traveling to, to Russia in addition to a series of other premiers and politicians this week. So, of course, everybody, um, including the premier, they were they were thrilled about that. A badge of honor was seemed to be like the line that that the premiers across Canada used from basically west west to east, starting with Premier Horgan in BC and all the way down. So uh, yeah, that was that was uh, that was interesting, very interesting to see. And then I'm really interested in this: um, a Regina man. Uh, this made huge news. Um, a Regina man won seventy million dollars. I'm not sure what lottery it was in exactly, but Lotto Max. He won the big. Trust me, Lotto Max. Lot of Max. Uh, <laughs> a lot of Max. Seventy million bucks. Wow. And this guy was about the most kind of normal uh, Saskatchewan, uh, Saskatchewanian. I almost mispronounced my own province there. <laughs> uh, really, really basic, humble guy. Uh, lives in Regina with his family. Um, I, I, I saw that he said, "Yeah." I, I, we're going to keep living here and our kids are young. So they're going to keep going to school and they need to keep leading a, leading a normal life. I thought that was cool. I was, I my was, question, I was so, yeah. sorry, Dale. I was on a zoom call yesterday morning with a few of my colleagues uh, in our company. And uh, one of them had not heard exactly who had won. It just heard that someone from Saskatchewan won it. And so asked me, well, actually it was June Drowdy, um, mm. a former colleague of mine in the legislature now uh, works with us at Prairie Sky, but she said, Kevin, were you the one that won the 70 million? And I said, with all due respect to my colleagues, if I had won the 70 million, I wouldn't be on this Zoom call this morning. Trust me, trust me on that. So, so where would, so Kevin, if you, if you weren't on the Zoom call, what would you be doing? What would you do with, with 70 million bucks? I have no idea. It's, it's hard um, to imagine. Yeah, it's one of those things. My dad, my, my late father, God bless his soul, used to sit there at the supper table, six kids in our family. Back in the day when the lotteries weren't very, I mean, relative to today's pot sizes, but he would always sit there and go around the table, <clears throat> excuse me, asking the kids, you know, just imagine, just like the commercial says, just imagine if, if your dad won the lottery, what, what would we, what would you want to do? And give each of the kids a, an opportunity to weigh in on what they would want to buy or where they'd want to go and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I just, I don't put my head to, you know, winning $70 million. What would I do? But, uh, I probably wouldn't be too concerned about making the podcast every week, Dale, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darn. <laughs> I'll have to look for somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, uh, no, that's, uh, uh, no, that's good. Sally, what about you? But, uh... I actually, I daydream about winning the lottery a lot for somebody who never actually buys a lot of <laughs> ticket. It's yeah. really... Um, I mean, two things. I buy myself a nice uh, bay house in Newfoundland, and the thing is, you can get a, a bay house in Newfoundland pretty cheap. the The problem is, it costs like two grand to fly there. So if I could reliably get there uh, frequently, I'd do that. Uh, and then also, I have a a sister who lives in uh, in Abu Dhabi in the UAE. Mm. Get, oh. on, get on a plane and go go see her. Pretty quick, smart, I think. Nice. Yeah. I don't. Okay, so. I don't know what a bay house is. What is a bay oh, house? Is just a house like around a, the bay. Like a, in, in, like a in lake Newfoundland. house? Yeah. Yeah, except for but, there is – so basically Newfoundland, you have town, St. John's, where I'm from, and everywhere else is the bay, with the exception of Gander, right. where the uh, the old American uh, Air Force base was, and there's uh, there's a uh, an airport there. Uh, every other community in Newfoundland is on a bay, on the water, on the ocean. Right. So, oh, wow. So basically, what? if you say, like, going around the bay, it could be anywhere that isn't in St. John's, essentially. Right. Right. Well, once again, I'm, I'm, I'm showing how little <laughs> I, I know ab about your home province, Sally. So I have to I'll confess, I did not know a whole ton about Saskatchewan before I moved here. So it's only fair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I would, um, I would, I would buy, so if I won 70 million bucks, I, I would buy some properties in, in various places around the world. And I'm going to tell you, Kevin, I would actually do more podcasting. <laughs> uh, well, I didn't say I wouldn't do anymore. I just said I wouldn't worry about making it on time to your podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Show up every now and again yeah. when I'm, uh, when I feel like yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> All right. Well, we can only hope that, uh, that, that we may, may win even a million bucks one day. All right. Um, so, yeah, spring session. Um, the people at the legislative building they were they were uh, off this week, spring break or Easter break, whatever we want to call it. This this happens every spring session. Um, for 
Kevin, uh, just just before we kind of, kind of dive into what this session has been like, um, what for 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 members for for current MLAs, and I guess you know maybe maybe Sally and I can speak to what it's like for um, you know as staff. What is this week um, this week off? Uh, what do what do MLAs do during it, or does it really vary? Is it looked at typically as a working week, or is it a kind of a catch up rest week? What yeah, it's, it's an it? interesting question, Dale, and I think it does vary, be, you know, depending on where you're from in the province. Uh, you know, some of these rural MLAs have anywhere from 15 to 20, 25 communities in their constituency. And I've always said that as, a, as an urban MLA, you know, we would, there was whatever there was of a seven or eight here in Regina, a SAS party caucus members that when there's events going on, they, they want someone from the government there and we could kind of split up these different events but if you're the MLA from Kindersley or Rosetown or, you know, pick a rural constituency and you've got that many communities in your constituency and they're holding events, they expect their MLA to be at those events. So um, it could be a very full schedule just going to events and uh, meetings um, with uh, with constituents and stakeholders for, for all MLAs. But it was funny, you know, when I was in MLA and, and the House wasn't sitting and uh, – when you're in the house or under the dome, we'd like to say, and Sally will appreciate this, as will you, Dale, you think the whole world is focused on what's going on underneath the dome and the legislature. And 99.9% yeah. .9 of the people are just living their lives. And and uh, I would meet people in the grocery store or whatever. And if the house wasn't sitting there, like, oh, you're on holiday. And I'm like, well, no, not exactly a holiday. It's a, There's a lot of other things to attend to, particularly if you're a cabinet minister and you're with your cabinet responsibilities. So, you know, this week during the session, the spring session is the longer one of the two. Uh, it's a nice time to kind of reconnect with your family and your community. And, and some MLAs, I'm sure, will take it as a chance to get away. Uh, others still have events. I saw some postings on Facebook yesterday of some events going on here that the Premier and other ministers were at. So uh, there's still work to be done. I'm sure the Cabinet committees are still meeting. And, and obviously, with the health ministers, uh, the, the pandemic is still on. They would be fully engaged, I'm quite sure, on their files with their officials. Right. So it's, it really varies. Uh, but it's when I was finance minister, it was a great time just to kind of recharge after going through the budget process and doing the circuit on the speeches. And then you just kind of have a little bit of downtime to, to not have to go out and talk budget, which is, which was fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sally, thinking, thinking back to my time at the ledge this week was, it, it, it was always a working week, but one where, you know, as Kevin kind of said, we could, we could catch our breath and uh, at least think, think about, how great the next, uh, you know, the last six weeks of session will be. What uh, does that, yeah, you kind of I looking mean, at that the same way? Or? Well, I actually, because but, but my, my brief tenure is as chief of staff, we had two short sessions. I had a kind of a fall and a spring one, and even the spring one because COVID um, oh, right. um, was on the go. And well, we had a truncated session with no break, which was – right tough right but also it was uh, the weird it was that period of time where we weren't even supposed to be traveling in between Regina and Saskatoon so we actually had all the MLAs down in uh in in Regina for that's for right the yeah. whole session and, and that nobody was, could leave nobody could nobody leave, could leave right, right? Yeah, and so yeah, that was yeah. really hard on you know for for people on both both government and uh and an opposition MLAs to kind of be away from your family um, for a staffer, uh, and no disrespect to uh, my my elected uh, friends and, and, and former colleagues, um, but having a bunch of politicians kicking around for a lot of weeks with away from their families and at, at loose ends was also pretty rough on the staff. Um, you know, and usually, yeah. <laughs> well, and usually you would you'd have Fridays off and. Um, yeah. You know, you don't have, you don't sit. The house, the legislature doesn't sit on on Fridays, and that's when the kind of the MLAs go back to their constituency offices or their their, their hometowns and stuff, and gives the staff that Friday to kind of plan for the week ahead. Where we were sitting, kind of some Fridays and actually some Saturdays during that session, it was uh, really quite quite intense. Um, you know that 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 kind of the the spring break for for staff. Uh, yeah, MLAs are back doing what they should be doing, knocking on doors, you know, spending some time with their families, going to those community events. Uh, but for staff, it gives you that chance to really kind of catch your breath and actually getting uh, getting some work done without kind of uh, uh, you know an elected official knocking on your door every 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 five minutes or so. I mean, yeah. it's also it's also really important in terms of just like 
the functioning of uh, of a session. Um, not going to lie, long sessions. Uh, everybody gets pretty squirrely towards the end of it, and it has some some kind of diminishing returns uh, <laughs> towards the end. Uh, question period is a lot punchier. Uh, people's nerves are are, are frayed uh, a little bit more. So uh, yeah, the the, the sessional break uh, gives everybody everybody's still working, uh, but definitely gives you that that chance to kind of take the temperature a little bit down. You know what though the 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 one thing about spring sh- uh, spring session that I've talked to lots of people about that is it's it's better than the fall session because. Um, it, it is longer. It's a, it's about twice as long, I think, or you know, roughly. But um, but the days are longer, so you get to work when it's light out. Yes. E- yeah. Even in March, and then by the time May rolls around, it's it, yeah. you know, it's it's just you know, uh, just well, and normally sunshine, working at it, the it, legislature. It yeah, normally working at the legislature in springtime, it's nice. At least you can kind of get out for a walk at lunch. But here we are still. Yeah under a pile of snow, <laughs> so yeah, we I don't know. have that at the moment, unfortunately. <laughs> I remember one so, time when I worked for the, the Manitoba government, uh, and uh, we un- unfortunately uh, raised the, the, the PST, um, the quirk of the kind of Manitoba legislators is essentially the government, you know, finds out when you start, but really the, the opposition can keep you in. And uh, we sat for, I think... Mm something like 14 or 15 weeks straight and all all through the summer and the, the manitoba legislature is just like a you know a limestone oven uh mm-hmm. with with no air con or anything it was uh it was not a fun time and you talk about kind of people getting squirrely uh, that was that was a rough one but the, you know the other thing uh dale and sally from a government perspective that the the this break the so-called well the, the easter break typically gives the government that if there is some issue that's really percolating out there that's not doesn't put the government in a good light and the opposition is gaining points on it and getting attention on it uh, on you know daily question period and, and dominating the news cycle if you will this break allows the government to kind of reset I'm not suggesting there's anything like that going on right now I, I can't th- think of any one particular item other than, of course the one that's common to all of us with respect to the COVID pandemic but it also gives the government an opportunity to kind of reset. It takes it off the front pages and off the nightly news cycle uh, every day for a week. And then you kind of, if you had momentum going as an opposition, now you got to kind of ramp that back up again. And you've only got, I think there's four weeks left of session if memory serves. But so there's that opportunity as well. You kind of, if I was in Sally's shoes, kind of go, geez, we're just really making traction here. And then you kind of got to go away for a week and get back to it next. But so, and that happens across the country and it, uh, it does give governments of different political stripes the opportunity to kind of retrench and reset and, and perhaps yeah. change the agenda. And it's also when you're back in your home communities and actually yeah. talking, hearing, hearing from folks, hear, hear, yeah. hearing from people at, at events or on the doors and things like that, you get a you get an idea of what's breaking through and what isn't. Exactly. Where if there's any traction, if the if the you know that issue has legs or not, and. In a lot of cases, the MLAs could come back and say, let them keep hammering away on that because nobody's talking about it at the coffee row or whatever. Exactly. Mm. Who knows, right? Or, so, right. listen, man, this yeah. is, I'm starting yeah. about to hear about this all the time. Yeah. we got to deal with this. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. So in the in the first episode that, that we did, which I think was at, at the end of the first week of session, Kevin, you, you, you framed uh, the legislative session as basically the opposition's opportunity mm-hmm. or the, like, it's, it's, it's in the, I forget how you said it exactly, but you said that session is is about the opposition's work. Yes, there, there's government bills to pass and the budgets and everything for the for the government, but with the because the focus is so much on question period, it it is a it is the opposition's opportunity uh, for for session. So I guess just you know if we were thinking about about what the halftime score, let's like let's say we're playing a football game right now. What's uh, for both of you guys? What's the halftime score? Right now, in terms of, uh, you know, like where are we at? Are we at a 14-13 uh, football game uh, for one side? And, you know, whereabouts are we at here in terms of – and obviously I'm not trying to trying to reduce politics down to point scoring, but, uh, <laughs> you know, what's the – you know, basically ha- has the opposition, have, have, they, have they been uh, reaching their objective for session? And what about for – 
for government side. Sally, what? Yeah, I what think, think? Uh, I think if you if you talk about kind of scoring points in this in, in terms of question period, that the NDP has been pretty disciplined um, on kind of message and question period and everything, and they've been getting kind of the media consistently to to reflect that. Um, particularly like COVID, because the media is still covering COVID and the NDP continues to, to focus on a lot of the issues around it, um, they've been, you know, more present, I think, in the media than some other years you might see with opposition. Also, the, they started session really ha- hammering, uh, hammering on the issue of affordability and, you know, the, the news over the past couple of days of, uh, you know, significant inflation and everything like that. So that's on top of uh, at, at the top of people's minds. So I don't know if I'd give it a point score, but particularly given that, you know, that is the opposition's time to shine. Uh, I think that they have used the the beginning of session quite well. Um, kind of were able to, we've talked about the budget before of, it wasn't, you know, a r- disastrous one for the government, but nor was it one that, you know, that people were really going like, oh, this is a great one. Um, so as an opposition able to kind of like neutralize that, um, and not have, uh, you know, the government uh, just have kind of days and days of stories of, you know, the, the, all the all these awesome things we're doing. Uh, so, yeah, I'd, I'd have to put them a couple points up. Oh, really? OK. Well, it probably yeah. wouldn't surprise you that I, I'll take a different <laughs> perspective. <laughs> uh, I think if uh, we're li- using a football analogy, Dale, that you brought up, I thought the opposition started the, the this legislative session down a touchdown. And the reason I say that is the loss of the Athabasca by-election happened just prior to the session starting and for all intents right. and purposes cost Mr. Miley his job and announced he was stepping down. So that takes a tremendous amount of focus off the government and the uh, you know the issues pertaining to the government right off the bat that the opposition now goes into a legislative session kind of, I mean, I know you got to put up a front, but I can't imagine that they were too jubilant having to go face the government benches knowing full well they lost one of their most... Uh, you know, reliable constituencies in the province in a by-election, which typically don't go in the favor of the government and that cost their leader their job and, and thrown them back into another leadership race. So I just say that as a, from an observational perspective that that would be difficult to, to happen just before a session starts where you think you've got totally. lots, lots of issues to deal with the government. So, uh, you know, that's going to put you back on your heels a little bit, but I agree with Sally. The, the opposition has been consistent in going after the government on some specific issues. Clearly, the inflation rate in Canada compounds that. Uh, and then you have a carbon tax coming in on April 1st that the federal government controls, and then a budget brought down that had some tax changes in it as well. And, and a broadening of the, the PST base uh, doesn't take effect till October 1st, but certainly, for all intents and purposes, is a tax increase. So, um, you know, there's some, there's some targets there for the opposition to, to hit upon. But if, if we're at halftime, uh, we might be at an even score then, because as I said at the beginning of this podcast a few weeks ago, uh, the House is for the opposition. It's their theater. They get to score points. Mm-hmm. The, the media, right. they dominate the media cycles. But I look at a couple of other things. The, the budget, uh, I think Sally used the, the terms, it wasn't disastrous yet. It wasn't something that people are talking about from a very positive perspective every single day. That's a win in my mind as a finance, former finance minister. They brought in a number of measures that they campaigned on, that they promised. The financial uh, metrics, if you will, look a lot better in the plan to get back to balance. Um, they've, they've underestimated, I think, the, the commodity uh, prices in the budget, which gives them some room during the course of the year. And mid-year will tell us a lot more about that. But the fact of the matter is that we're two or three weeks after the budget. Nobody's really talking about it, good or bad. That, to me, as a former finance minister, is very positive, unless you're in an election year kind of thing and you want people talking about your budget. The other aspect I would look at that doesn't get a lot of media, if any, uh, or attention, is labor peace in the province. We've had relative labor peace Mm -hmm. in this province now for um, a number of years. And if you go back, and I was the chair of the Cabinet Committee on Public Sector Bargaining when I was the finance minister, and at that time, if memory serves, there was like 38 or 39 collective agreements that the, the government of Saskatchewan um, had to bargain and ratify with different, uh, with different unions in the province, public sector employee unions. When's the last time you had a strike in this province, uh, in the public sector? When's the last time you had a... I mean, I remember they used to march on the, on the lawn when I was finance minister with my big fat head on a stick and the premier walls and others. 
When's the last yeah. time any of that has happened during a, you know, a pretty volatile times with respect to the pandemic? And they've signed collective agreements with some of these major unions during the course of this pandemic. So, you know, it, it's one of those stories that kind of flows under the surface, but it's absolutely critically important for the government of any stripe of any province to have labor peace. And we've seen that here in Saskatchewan. So I think that's a that's a real credit to the labor minister and those are responsible for those collective agreements and the government in general. Yeah. Just back to the, the budget, and I, you know, I, I agree. Like when when people aren't our, aren't out on the you know the lawn with with pitchforks or or whatever, uh, then that's that's not bad. But I was surprised um, from a communication standpoint, and as I, I think the the listeners know, that is that is strictly my background um, in politics. That they weren't able to get a bit more of a bounce out of that kind of uh, decreased deficit. Um, that you know, I, I would have expected kind Through of the government more, side you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly, right? yeah, exactly. Right. I would have kind of expected right. more of that. Uh, and also, and this is just me kind of on the inside baseball of the straight comms of not either trial ballooning or testing some of those kind of tax increases, you know, on the riders games, on the concerts and everything like that. As I've said before, the tax on fun, uh, that that kind of came out of nowhere. Normally when you're going in and you know, something is going to be a bit smelly in a, in a budget, you try to, um, you know, either telegraph it a little bit, but I, it didn't seem like there was a real calm strategy to deal with that. They just kind of went, you know, we'll take our lumps on it. Well, the Minister mm-hmm. of Finance, to be fair, did, did equate it to the, you know, it was, I think it's $21 million per annum, and mm-hmm. did equate that to the Surgical Backlog Initiative that's $21 mm-hmm. million. Dollars. And so one could tie directly that, you know, expanded PST, PST base with the revenues over to helping on the Surgical Backlog. You know, but I, I don't disagree with you, Sally, from a comms perspective. It caught me off guard, too, and I was kind of like, oh, that, that's kind of a, that's an interesting one, and, and the timing seems a little strange. And But, I, you know, I... I I'll give the minister the benefit of the doubt. That's what she tied it to. And, and I, I take her at her word. Um, as far as a bump goes because of the deficit reduction, I don't think deficits matter to anybody anymore. I think Mr. Trudeau has proven that in spades. That they, you start throwing out these <laughs> yeah. massive numbers and people just kind of roll their eyes and go, That's you know, true. is that important or this not important? And I don't think that it, and it, it frustrates me that we, as a small C conservative. Okay. It frustrates me in the sense that, these chickens will come home to roost eventually in some form or fashion with governments that let their budgets run, you know, run crazy. And, and uh, you've got to keep your eye on those things. So, uh, but I think your point is well taken, Sally, that, that yeah. folks just aren't talking about deficits anymore. This is something that, uh, that after the podcast we did last week where we talked um, about the federal budget, I was driving a couple of days later. And I got really mad at myself because I realized I didn't ask this question about whether people actually care about whether the budget is balanced or how much the deficit is or how much the debt is. People, uh, because it was something I was I really wanted to to talk to you guys about, but it's it's a I matter of as a host. The, the difference between kind of caring and voting on it. Yeah. I think because you definitely right. on the on the the uh, conservative side and I mean you know I, I think people kind of across the political spectrum who are uh, interested in economics you know see see what it is but even for people who are real kind of deficit hawks is that what the, is their vote determiner and I think that that where the kind of debt and deficit is a real vote determiner is pretty niche and small section yeah. uh, but it's exactly that when we start to talk about those millions and billions of dollars it, it's so kind of esoteric to so many people we always used to say, when i was working federally during the days of uh, of bev Oda, where you know she ended up having uh, out of cabinet because of a 16 dollar orange juice and that's something that right. people understand and get mad about like uh, like uh, who orders a 16 dollar orange juice on the taxpayer's dime right it's just that what the brain yeah. can kind of really process and not but w- when this matters the most and when people will start <clears throat> i think turning their attention back to it is when interest rates start going up again and we're going to see that this coming year the bank of canada for all intents and purposes totally. has signaled that they're going to be very aggressive in interest rate increases over the course of the next 12 to 18 months maybe maybe as many as four different rate increases now we're not going to get back to the 80s where you're at 18 19 20 22 percent interest rates but here's how this Fingers impacts crossed. Right. Here's how this impacts provincial governments is if 
In the last couple of years, I think, I think I'm, I'm correct in this, the province of Ontario and the province of Alberta had to float 100-year bonds out in the international investment community to borrow money because they have to, they, they, the, they have to put out that amortization period that long in order to afford the money that they're borrowing based on the basis points, interest rates they have to pay for that paper. If interest rates start going up and provinces and the federal government, well, the federal government can print money, but provinces ha still have to keep borrowing, it's going to impact their ability to make those interest payments on those on those bonds and, that, and those investments, or the, those borrowing. So you're going to start to see that line item in provincial budgets growing exponentially if interest rates go up that dramatically, that fast, mm -hmm. and provinces haven't balanced their budget and they have to borrow money for operating purposes. So uh, I think that's when people and in, in media and, and academics will really start paying attention to it again. What are the... What are the keys to to success for the second half of the session for for both teams, uh, you guys? Sally, for for Ryan Miley, is it is it uh, you know you can tell me what what those keys are, but is is the end goal for him at this point to to ensure a smooth a smooth handover to the next leader? Absolutely. Make sure that. Yeah. I think I think that's for any 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 leader who is who who has stepped down that that is the 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 number one thing and concern. Um, you know the 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 philosophy of in politics of do no harm, right? You want to make sure that you leave things as as good as you possibly can on the way out uh, the door. In terms of success for the opposition, um, it's this is where it it gets hard to keep that discipline. Um, it, you get kind of a discipline of message, you get bored, you feel like you're saying things over and over again, you know, MLAs in their credit portfolios have issues that they are all passionate about that they want to get in and under the radar, you know, before a session is over. Um, so I think, as I said, I think they've been doing a real good job of staying disciplined and staying on, on uh, focused on the, the two main things that has been getting them uh, uh, good media. But in, in my experience, both here and, and other jobs I have, uh, the further you get into session, the harder it is to kind of keep that discipline message going. Uh, it's also the, the second part is like where you're actually kind of the, the, the actual business of being in the legislature and passing bills and stuff like that. You get a lot more of, yeah. of that done. Um, I think, you know, the beginning of session budget, people are paying a little more attention. Uh, so for, for the NDP, it's uh, just trying to, you know, keep on the map and keep in the media. Right. Kevin, if you were in caucus uh, next week on Monday, what what's somebody like uh, like a Reg Downs gonna gonna be saying in the room in terms of here here's what we hope to accomplish for the for the next for the for the final six weeks here? Well, again, what's uh, the goal? Uh, the House, the, the the sitting of the of the legislature, as I've said, is the theater for the opposition. So it's the old, it's kind of like campaigning. No bozo eruptions, no crazy things. Uh, that gives the opposition, you know, that's it's those are things that help bring down governments, a scandal or uh, doing crazy things. So this is a pretty disciplined caucus. I've been amazed at watching how, oh. how solid this caucus has remained behind the premier and their their cabinet during some very, very difficult times, which we haven't seen in other provinces, including at the federal level with some of uh, federal level with some of the uh, liberal backbenchers speaking out against their own their own government. So they want to get through the last four weeks or six weeks, whatever it is. Uh, to get their legislation passed, and Sally's right, it all turns to committee work now. You have your 25 minutes of QP in, on Monday through Thursday, and then they typically go into committee work where they're passing the estimates or, or finalizing the, uh, uh, the bills that are on the table uh, in the legislative process. And then I think, you know, I, and I have no information on this whatsoever, inside information, but I, I think that it's probably... I'm sure that Reg Downs and others that, that are around the Premier are looking at, okay, Premier... Um, after this session, we're going to be just over two years out from the next election. Um, do we know if everybody's running again? Who might be considering mm. retiring? Um, who might have some health issues that they, they're going to have to go and deal with? And, you know, can they ride out the term, so to speak? Will Mr. Miley resign his seat or stay on? I don't know, but, you know, one could speculate on whether Ryan wants to stick around if he's no longer the leader in that MLA. So will that open up a seat for a by-election? Will he change up the cabinet? And if he looks around his cabinet and says, you know, who's the team I want to go into the next election with from a cabinet perspective? Are there members of the cabinet who are not going to run again or who maybe want a different role or might just be tired? So all of those things politically are being considered as you come to the end of a session where you're going to be two years out from the next election. And I'm sure that they're, uh, uh, Reg Downs is a brilliant political strategist and he thinks of it, he, yeah. he can multitask on a number of these things. And 
Shannon Andrews, the premier's chief of staff, is a very, very solid, competent woman. So uh, that's what they'll be, I'm sure, be thinking about and chatting with the with the premier about. I, I have to give it to you. The the level of caucus discipline was just a, a constant frustration to me. <laughs> it continues to be when you you look at um, you know the the troubles that uh, Jason Kenney has had uh, in Alberta with his own caucus, and I, I used to say like, why yep. can't we have nice things like that here? You know. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You know, why is nobody dining anybody... dining on the roof with white tablecloths and a bottle of Jameson? Like, come on, man. <laughs> Something to work with here. <laughs> yeah. And if anybody would like to read more about that, I wrote a column uh, that alluded to these things a couple a couple weeks ago. You back, did. I so. thought it was a good column, Dale. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, very, very good insight there, you guys. Yeah. I um, yeah. The cabinet shuffle. That's uh, Kevin. That's that's an interesting point to make. I'd I'd I'd, I'd heard kind of mixed. Uh, some people think that they're. That there will be a shuffle sometime this spring or summer, but I'd bet on a uh, shuffle. I, I think you know again. Well, I'll... somebody somebody made a good point to me this week. They said uh, you would think that the, that there might be, but there was some talk about waiting uh, for the uh, for the boundary commission right. to 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 give their recommendations first, so that the people in in caucus currently can figure out you know where they're going to run. Still, you know the. The math, I guess, you, you know, the chessboard. So, but if, some, thought, if someone says, was, "Look, I'm not running again, Premier," so um, yeah, just yeah, regardless of yeah, yeah. And, and I and again, I, I have no idea if that pertains to anybody or not. It, uh, but it's a, uh, um, you know, it's a good question to ask, and, and you can bet they're putting their minds to that. And I'm sure the Premier will be having discussions with all of his caucus members one on one just to kind of get uh, a feel for where they're at and how they feel about things and and uh, where they're at in their personal lives. Right. Right. Okay. Well, very good insight there. Thank you, you guys. Uh, we're that was a yeah that that took up a, a big chunk of time. So uh, I'm just conscious of uh, how much time we have left. Let's just quickly talk about this uh, leader post story from Jeremy Symes that he wrote earlier this week uh, about the Saskatchewan Liberal Party who who knew that they were still <laughs> still around. Um, but they, the gist of the story was that they, they put out a petition, um, that called for a public inquiry into the government's COVID-19 response. And, uh, to, I, I think the rule is that to trigger a public inquiry, you need to, I think it's 10% of, of all Saskatchewan residents. Um, they're never going to get that. It's never going to be triggered. No. If they do, it would be like the greatest thing ever and, Probably the Liberal Party should be the official, should be the official opposition if they can, you know, somehow get that much support. But, um, but I, I'm overall I'm fascinated by okay, you know, what why, uh, who thinks that the that uh, that a party like this or any third parties, whether it's you know the Liberals or the PCs or the Greens in Saskatchewan, um, this story struck me as uh, question. There's no question period this week. And the editors in the newsroom um, at the Leader Post said, "Go, go and talk to one of the, one of the, you know, third party, um, one of the third parties, and see what they're up to." But um, do we? Does anybody in Saskatchewan think about the Saskatchewan Liberal Party anymore, Kevin? Like genuinely? Uh, not in my discussions, but uh, you know, from a political observation perspective, I give Mr. Walters credit. He uh, he was able to. Uh, uh, hold a right. news conference and get the attention of the mainstream media and get talked about. Um, you know, again, the, the hard slogging part about politics to be successful is, is just like an iceberg. You know, 90% of it is below the surface on the work that they're doing under the surface of the water. And for him to get a news conference and to get an issue on the table, I, I give him full credit for that. Uh, will that have any traction? Uh, I guess remains to be seen in all fairness. He's, but he's doing, it looks like he's doing the work necessary. You know, you talk to those eight MLAs that were involved in the formation of the Saskatchewan party. Uh, and of course, Mr. Hepner has passed on, but uh, the remaining seven, and, and I've had long conversations with June Drowdy because we work together still. You know, they would send out two MLAs, drive two hours out in an evening to meet with four people and then drive two right. hours back and have to be in the house the next day. And, and they were doing this consistently every single night of it or every single, single day of, of the week. So that's the kind of hard slogging work that has to go on as you form, in that case, a brand new party. In the case of the reemergence of the Provincial Liberal Party, keep in mind that the Provincial Liberal Party for years was a very strong um, 
presence, political presence in this province, having governed for seven years in the Ross Thatcher areas and then earlier on in the history yep. of the province. Um, so it, it remains to be seen. I give Mr. Walters credit for uh, for attracting some media attention and if there's any traction. When was the last time you had a Liberal leader in Saskatchewan have a news conference? I don't, I can't remember in the last 10 years. Right. You know, so we'll see. Yeah, I, I can't see there being a ton of traction, but again, uh, credit because now I know the name of uh, the, the Liberal leader, which I didn't previously. I thought it was still, they had an interim leader. I can't remember his name. All I remember is that he gave an interview prior to the last election where he talked about being, um, you know, it seemed like a really interesting character, a, a, a follower of the old Nordic gods, I believe, was, was one of the quotes in the in the article. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, great for them. I, I personally, uh, as somebody who worked, uh, has worked for the NDP in Ontario and, uh, and federally in the East and stuff, I personally love uh, being on the prairies uh, in, in Saskatchewan and having that kind of direct head-to-head um, you know, kind of conservative and, and progressive, uh, without having to deal with uh, mushy liberals who campaign on the left and govern yeah. on the right. Um, I kind of yeah. like it too. Yeah, I like no, it too. I'm super into it. I think Kevin likely <laughs> does as well. Yeah. Well, the thing is that uh, what they have to get through is they're liberals. I mean, it's in Saskatchewan. Um, Mr. Goodell obviously was the last liberal MP that was elected here, and then was pretty soundly defeated uh, a couple elections ago. But you know, anytime. This particular gentleman, the leader, Mr. Walters, or any of his candidates go and introduce himself. And who are you with? I'm with the Liberal Party. That's going to be a barrier you're going to have to get through immediately here in Saskatchewan, unfortunately, yeah. for them. Yeah. So. I was trying to figure out the last time that the Saskatchewan Liberal Party made a tangible uh, impact on on anything uh, like electorally uh, in Saskatchewan. And the, and, the, and the example that I came up with was... In Saskatoon Westview in 2016, the Liberal candidate uh, got it was about it was almost 300 votes, and and that was the margin of difference between Cam Broughton and yep. and David Buckingham, and of course that uh, the, uh, the Liberal candidate, uh, the story of course is that he was mad at the NDP or he, he was pissed off at Cam Broughton or something. So we just ran like it was it was a spite campaign, and he and he, and he pulled enough move, votes. Like, I think is what we call that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, well, <laughs> that well, is a dick well move, again, it's but... perspective, Sally. I thought it was. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Right? Yeah, <laughs> David David Buck David Buckingham's thrilled about that dick move. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was cheering him anyway. on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, I want, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the last election results and who got more actual raw vote. Would I, th I think it would have still been the Green Party over the Liberals. I think the Green Party actually ran I think more so. candidates at least. Twenty. I think twenty twenty twenty. They um. The, I think the Greens Greens did better in twenty sixteen. The Liberal Party they they actually did. Uh, significantly better than 2011 because of the Trudeau bump. Yep. There were some, there were some folks that exactly right. Yep. Uh, and they didn't realize that, that the uh, Saskatchewan liberal party has nothing to do with, well, well, really with the federal liberal party. So um, other than the name anyway. All right. As I was saying, maybe, uh, maybe the PC party will, will get a story as well later this week, but I doubt but it. We're, we're, we're going right, to have we, to do a, a podcast one of these days, Dale on, uh, when I was thinking about coming into the, this session and events that are, I, I equate it back to people's lives, everybody can look at their own life and know, I think it's pretty fair to say that there was probably six or seven or eight events in their lives that, that changed their lives. And that can be from everything, what you choose to do for education purposes, what kind of career you choose to marriages, divorces, deaths, those kinds of very significant events in everyone's life that's changed the direct trajectory of their life, good or bad. And I think the same thing holds true in politics. <clears throat> and if you look at that by-election loss in Athabasca, not to, not to harp on that, but as an example. Oh. No, no, I, and I'm, I'm dead serious about this. Sally. Sally's going to no, leave I here. Know, I get it. I, She's going to hang I'm up. Not trying to, I'm not trying to put the fork in any further, but, but <laughs> that was a significant event that changed the political trajectory of the NDP party in Saskatchewan. Now, Dale Eisner's got a book coming out next week I'm looking forward to reading. That's on right. On the 40th anniversary of the – well, it just coincides with the 40th anniversary of the Divine Victory – in 1982 
And he talks about the province's transformation from left to right. And, and Dale's a good friend, and I have a lot of time and respect for him. But it'd be interesting to look at different political events during the course of those last four decades that changed the trajectory of different political individuals and parties. And I think that that's a, that would be a worthy topic to look back on over the last 40 years or so and just, and just kind of pick out those individual yeah. events and what impact they had on respective political parties and respective political individuals. Yeah, yeah the, the What If podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be interesting. We should also yeah. start, I, I should start boning up on the Boundary Commission stuff because I imagine uh, that for the, that's going to be, uh, you know, in terms of shaping the province and kind of political future, something that kind of always slides under the radar uh, kind of in the public eye, but actually has, you know, a massive uh, influence on kind of various different yeah. political outcomes. Right. Oh, yeah. No. And, and there's – it will make big news because somebody is being, uh, being appointed to the commission. That ma- makes me very happy and, uh, and I'm sure Kevin as well. But, oh, yeah, no, it, it'll, be, it, it'll be big news, I think, that one. So, anyway, we're almost out of time. Hansard Hot Takes, what, uh, what do you guys quickly have? Kevin? Um, or yeah, Sally, go ahead, go ahead, Kevin. Well, mine was going to be yeah. to talk about Eisler's book coming out, but we'll, maybe we'll wait till next week <laughs> after it's out. Uh, and I haven't read it, so I don't know what's all in it. But uh, the thing that caught my eye this week, I thought was extraordinarily so significant, was the appointment of Heather Ryan as the new chief executive officer of Federated Co-op. Hmm, yeah. uh, I, I don't know Miss Ryan at all. We may have met at some point in time during my political career, but I just think for an organization, a company of that size and influence and impact in the province of Saskatchewan, uh, for Miss Ryan to be appointed its first ever female uh, CEO was uh, historically significant and, and well worthy of a, of a mention here today. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. That was good news. Sally? What's yeah, um, I, I kind of, I'm having a mental block and I, I, I thought I was going to talk about this last week, but then I don't think I did or I don't know if we had time last week or whatever, but stop me if I'm repeating myself. But I do want to give a shout out to uh, Betty Nippy Albright, um, the Métis Relations, First Nations and Métis Relations critic for the NDP, uh, who's introduced a bill um, to try to improve the duty to consult processes um, with right. the uh, with the Saskatchewan government. And particularly, it's, she really, when she kind of brought this bill together, um, she's really done a ton of work with First Nations, Métis leaders all across uh, the province and had that real broad support. So uh, when you, whenever you have is that kind of bill, to have that show of community, this is not just something that the NDP is putting forward. We are here on, you know, representing so many people across the province to which this is really important. Uh, and I thought she did a, did a great job of, uh, and has been actually doing a great job of um, bringing, bringing that issue to the table in Saskatchewan. Yeah, there should be there should be more coverage on that because because people in the private sector are talking about it. I know, and um, yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to interesting to see what government does in the in the remaining weeks of of uh, session because because they'll have to vote on it. Mm-hmm. It'll 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 go go to a vote uh, to a vote on the floor. So, mm-hmm. uh, my answered hot take it's about the the New York Times executive editor uh, a couple of weeks back sent out a memo to to staff to newsroom staff encouraging them to start uh, meaningfully meaningfully reduce how much time they spend on Twitter. And I was absolutely fascinated by it. Um, and the reason I was was because I, ha- I had already planned to, to write a column about this very topic and about how media and people in politics need to start unwinding their use from Twitter. So I was I, – I have been ecstatic about reading that and um, – yeah, I think it's a great idea, and and I hope everybody does it. And and I was told this morning, but by, by somebody that at CBC, I guess that they have been encouraging their their staff to to do that. I haven't personally seen them unwinding, but uh, maybe I'm not looking that hard. So yeah, that was interesting. Well, and it's interesting of one of Twitter being kind of you know the echo chamber that it is. I'm constantly you know, through, through my life telling politicians or whatever, like four people tweeting about something on Twitter is not an issue we have to deal with right now. Okay. Um, yeah. But also if that is coinciding with, uh, you know, Elon Musk, um, you know, take over, take over bid for Twitter. I got, I got my first hate mail in a while when I did CDC this week and referred to Elon Musk as a, a snake oil salesman. Um, oh. the, the Elon Musk bros are, are a mighty, uh, mighty group. And yeah. don't take uh, too kindly to that one. 
He, he has ties huh? to Saskatchewan, Sally. You got to be careful. Here. I know. Waldeck. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, as an aside, my last one, Waldeck is, is uh, just because we, you know, we pass it when we're driving into Alberta or whatever. And every time we drive past, um, I get a kick out of it because it just says no services. Like, don't even think of stopping at Waldeck, <laughs> right. man. Keep on moving. <laughs> I got such a kick out of it. And every time we yeah. pass it, I, I, have the, I have the same chuckle. No yeah, services here, boys. Keep moving. Can I get Can I get some gas? Did you not see the sign on the highway? <laughs> no, <I'm> not. <laughs> <laughs> Keep moving. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all the time we have. Uh, th- thank you, guys. That, w- that was another awesome episode. Always really a pleasure. Appreciate the insight. And, and, th- and thanks to everybody that's been listening. Uh, and if you would like to leave a very uh, nice review like the, <laughs> like the person at the top did, uh, we'd appreciate it very much. So thanks for listening, and we will we'll see you next week. You bet. Thanks, guys.